Welcome to the Immune Related Adverse Events Symposium. We're just going to call it IRAE Symposium. And thank you for being here. My name is Tyler Schaller, and I direct our IRAE research program, and I will be your moderator today. This program is important to me because I spent years developing immunotherapies, drugs that are saving cancer patient lives and extending lives. However, they have and can, have, can often have serious and even life-threatening side effects. And it is these side effects that this program is trying to improve. So let me give you a little background of, about Project Data Sphere. Our mission is to improve cancer patient care. And we do this in three ways. One, we convene key stakeholders such as yourself listening in today. So these stakeholders include physicians, regulators, drug developers, and scientists. Second, we catalyze drug development using our big data platform, um, data analysis, hosting and sharing of clinical and uh, trial data sets. And third, we collaborate with these key stakeholders in various research projects including the topic of today, our immune-related adverse events research program. Let me give you just a short introduction to the agenda of today. We're going to start out diving into the IRAE program introduction, and a little bit of the history. We will then hear from a patient advocate on what it truly means to deal with IRAEs. We will then focus on two of our work streams, the neurological and the dermatologic IRAE work streams. And then finally, I'm very much looking forward to a panel discussion on the IRAE landscape as presented by members and scientists with diverse viewpoints. I hope you'll find this meeting engaging. I'm sure you will. And I hope you will remember what we talk about today as we engage more in the future weeks. And now I would like to introduce Carrie Reynolds, my colleague and friend. For, um, Carrie is a physician and oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's also the director of MGH's Severe Immunotherapy Complications Service, which is really a pioneering service that maybe we'll get to hear about. And she's been a centerpiece of the Project Data Sphere IRAE program, driven, she's been driving our current work streams, our future work streams. So really happy. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us to you. Tylo, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who is joining the symposium today. I feel privileged to be able to kick it off. And so why study immune-related adverse events? So the audience here is very familiar likely with the scope that we're gonna talk about today. And that is adverse events related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So how do these drugs work? It's fascinating because many times a day, our immune system is trying to recognize self versus non-self or a pathogen, something that needs to be attacked. And so here in this bluish purple cell that you can see this T cell, Many, many times a day, there's an antigen presenting cell shown here in green that presents this little blue antigen on the MHC molecule up to the T cell receptor. But that does not activate the immune system by itself. It requires a co-stimulatory signal. And then the immune system is off to the races. However, we don't want unregulated autoimmunity and we have to dampen that inflammatory response. And so there are key checkpoints. One of them, you can see these little intracellular vesicles, they take CTLA-4 to the cell surface. So really right off the bat, they take that molecule to the cell surface and that competes and it is able to dampen that immune signal. However, cancer can evade the immune system. So by targeting these checkpoints, by targeting CTLA-4 with a drug such as ipilimumab, we're able then to harness the adaptive response of the immune system to cancer. In addition, newer agents, when we think about once the T cell 
start to proliferate, secrete cytokines, migrate to the tissue. Soon there's a checkpoint PD-1 that is expressed as well as in the tissues, there's PD-L1, it's ligand. And so together that is a critical checkpoint to also dampen the immune response. But in order to get activation against the cancer, we have these drugs that you see here, the anti-PD-L ones on the left, there are three now approved, and anti-PD-1 on the right, there are three that approved. And this is not a slide where you have to read each approval by any means, but I just want you to step back and take a look at the amount of activity in a decade. It's really phenomenal. Starting with 2011, ipilimumab was approved for metastatic melanoma, and now there are over 55 indications for those seven drugs that I showed you in the last slide. And it's in over 15 cancer types. And I actually color coded these light blue versus dark blue because the dark blue is no longer single agent checkpoint inhibitors, but it is combination regimens with a checkpoint inhibitor. And you can see that is becoming more frequent in the recent years in terms of approval. And we want you to leave here today knowing that immunotherapy is a good news story. These immune checkpoint inhibitors have really revolutionized the treatment of cancer. And you can see on the left the types of diseases that it is approved for and over uh, an average of the response rates. And so some of these are durable long-term responses in patients that are very difficult to treat otherwise. So this is absolutely incredible but we have reported, as many others have, conditions that we are seeing that are inflammatory in nature, autoimmune-like, but not exactly, and these are immune-related adverse events. Again, not to know every condition on the left, but you can see inflammation or itis can occur in almost every organ system, the colon, the liver, the lungs, the endocrine organs, the heart, the kidney, the bone marrow, the joints, the skin, the nerves, or even the eyes. And so all of these systems can be affected. And what is hard to put into words is what that's like at the bedside. And so I just wanna tell you about a case of a 47 year old gentleman that we saw in 2016. So first when he had a liver biopsy consistent with cholangiocarcinoma and his disease had moved to the lungs. And so he had metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. He was started on first line therapy with chemotherapy, which is the standard of care, cisplatin and gemcitabine. But unfortunately, within just a few months, his disease progressed. At that time, we had a clinical trial with nivolumab and a small molecule inhibitor that he was eligible for, and he started therapy. But within just a few cycles, unfortunately, January of that next year, he developed inflammation of the heart or myocarditis, and congestive heart failure was inpatient. He was started on high dose steroids and treated with steroids, but unfortunately, even before coming off was diagnosed with hepatitis, biopsy proven to also be consistent with immune checkpoint inhibitor. At that time, we tried to add cell step because the immune system was so relentless, but he developed a third immune related adverse event, aplastic anemia. And this is all while the liver lesion actually showed some response. Unfortunately, with this long course of immunosuppression with steroids, he developed compression fracture in his back from the osteoporosis from the drug, he even needed kyphoplasty or cement in order to buffer the fractures. And he ended up passing away and it was not of the cholangiocarcinoma, it was refractory toxicities from immune checkpoint inhibitors. And this case has so much meaning to us and it really engaged us to think about care in a different way because these various systems could be involved and we knew we needed a team that could cover all of the types of systems. And so we developed the severe immunotherapy complications service at Massachusetts General Hospital in 2017. It's now 52 members really across six different departments and 10 divisions of medicine because you need one of every organ system as we, as we showed. And it is oncologists sitting next to subspecialists, sitting right next to the basic scientists as well. Chloe Villani is shown on the top right here and leads our translational effort. There are 15 individuals you can see in her lab under her, and a lot of them bridge between the clinic and the lab. We don't have the time to really talk about some of those efforts. There is a website, or if you even Google stick in MGH, 
um, you can kind of learn a bit more about what we're trying to do, but we care for patients together and we've seen all patients with severe immunotherapy complications since that time. In addition, we have a clinical registry to really start to try to understand what are the clinical phenotypes and the predictors, and then the translational effort as well. And no one center wants to, nor can do this alone. And that is so crystal clear because as our vision, along with many others working in this field and many on this call today, how do we define this new set of diseases? How do we really describe best practices to manage these conditions, especially when it's atypical? And can we figure out who is gonna get this type of toxicity and who is gonna get severe disease? Because we are over treating a subset of patients and we're probably under treating the other subset. And diagnostics, I showed you at the beginning that combination therapy is here to stay. And it is really important that we figure out what is immune related and what is not. And what is the underlying pathophysiology? We're really trying to understand every single cell in the tissue to think about, could that inform clinical trials then for the treatment of toxicity of these patients? And who is safe to re-challenge outside of say the endocrine toxicities? And so these are the key aspects that all of us are trying to move forward with. But honestly, toxicity management in 2021 is very similar to what it has been. For most non-endocrine IREs for mild disease, you treat symptomatically. For mild, it's oral corticosteroids. For severe, it's admit to the hospital with IV doses of steroids. And if steroid refractory, consider second line. There are nuances to this for sure, but we still have a long way to go as this is remarkably the same as it's been. And so knowing that one center could not really embark on this without really the, the key connections we started interacting with Project Data Sphere in 2017. At the same time, they had brought together the Checkpoint Inhibitor Safety Working Group to really tackle myocarditis. And that lead was Tom Nealon, who's our cardio-oncologist in the Severe Immunotherapy Complication Group. So he linked the two together. So it was April 18, when we met to really talk about at our own center across that wheel, across the toxicities, what about the future state? Let's look long-term and thinking about the reporting of adverse events and learning from them. And then after it was at our own center workshop, we decided it was key to engage all of the stakeholders again. And so Project Datasphere was able to bring everybody back together in April, 2019 in Washington, DC when we could still meet each other. And that was the symposium for immune related adverse events and combination therapy. And it became clear then that classifications and the basic definitions are the building blocks to everything we do, to pulling cases together and studying outcomes, to collecting samples and translational research, we have to have the front end or the definitions clear. And so that's why in October of 2020, we launched the neurotoxicity effort. And in 2020 um, as well, we launched the dermatology toxicity effort. And you are gonna hear from those leaders today, which is incredible work. Why is this important? It's estimated in the US alone, we'll treat 233,000 patients this year with checkpoint inhibitor. That's not even patients on trial. And when you look at the percentage, even if we just look at that middle column of severe disease, if we think it ranges anywhere from 14% with single agent PD-1 up to 55% with combination, that is over 32,000 patients at the lowest end that have potential to be affected by these conditions. In addition, in thankfully, it's relatively rare at only about 1%, the death rates are on the right, but it does happen and it is critical. And I can give you all of those numbers, but honestly, I think our teammates as well, Dr. Regina Santamarina can, can share her perspective with you today. And so I'm gonna actually take off my um, video and allow Regina to share her story. It is my absolute honor and privilege to be here today and be able to share with you the story, our story with immunotherapy. And I do so in behalf of all the other patients and families who also have a story and a relationship with immunotherapy. Let me start by telling you who my husband was. Rodrigo was a plastic reconstructive and hand surgeon who trained for 12 years in order to fulfill 
his professional goal. He was also a self-taught artist. He used to tell me, when I retire, I want to paint. Not knowing that that day was not going to be granted for him, in 2012, he decided that he was not longer waiting. And he started to paint and unveil a hidden talent that quickly became one of his favorite hobbies. He painted close to 100 paintings and he left his personality reflected in each and every one of them. They are bold, colorful, fearless. But it was not the title of plastic surgeon or artist, the title that gave him the most pride and happiness in his life. It was the title of being a dad, the one that fulfilled him completely. We have two kids, Daniela and Gabriel, who were 14 and 15 at the time of his passing. April, 2016, six months after opening a solo private practice, Santa Marina Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery, we faced a devastating diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma in an advanced stage. It gave no signs, no symptoms. It was through a shoulder x-ray that showed the tip of his right lung with a rare lesion that prompted more studies that made us discover the underlying cholangiocarcinoma that he had. He received traditional chemotherapy as first line treatment, and we were given the opportunity to join a clinical trial with immunotherapy at Mass General Hospital. We gladly and gratefully accepted. Shortly after he started receiving the drugs, he developed the first adverse reaction, myocarditis. He was severely ill. We thought he was not going to make it through. He was hospitalized in the intensive care unit at our local hospital, that's Berkshire Medical Center in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And as soon as he was stable, he was transferred to the intensive care unit at Mass General Hospital. They took massive doses of steroids to be able to control the reaction. When the reaction was controlled and we started tapering down the steroids, another organ flared up. This time it was the liver causing him an hepatitis. In this case, same scenario, we went to our local hospital and then immediately transferred to Mass General Hospital. And that's when we met Dr. Kerry Reynolds. The same situation with steroids and Celsept and other immunosuppressants and nothing was working. And again, as soon as we tried to taper down, another organ flared. And this time it was his bone marrow to the point of becoming transfusion dependent. Rodrigo spent 174 days in the hospital. He endured a lot of pain because of the compression fractures that the steroids caused in his back. He underwent procedures to help mitigate the pain. He finally passed away on October, 2017, 18 months after his diagnosis at the age of 47. The most important message that I would like to leave today with all of you is what immunotherapy meant for us. Immunotherapy meant hope. And I'm gonna say it again. Immunotherapy meant hope. And that hope was the source of strength to keep fighting, to keep pushing, to not give up. It gave Rodrigo the strength, but it also gave me as his spouse, his family, the same strength to support him because it was working. The tumor was shrinking. So we kept thinking to ourselves and praying, if, if only we can control the adverse reactions, he has a chance. I have no doubt in my 
heart and in my mind that if we were given the same opportunity again, we would take it. We would sign up for that clinical trial and we would do it all over again. Last summer, I had the opportunity to be in the same room with many of the outstanding members of this team. And let me tell you, the energy in that room was unbelievable. They are remarkable and they are eager to find the questions to be able to control these adverse reactions, to predict them or to minimize them. I wholeheartedly not only support, but applaud their efforts. I wish that the research efforts are supported in every possible way so that they are able to continue giving the gift of hope to as many patients and as many families as possible. And I would like to end by saying two very simple words, but they are heartfelt words. Thank you. Thank you for that tireless work day in and day out to find questions, to find answers to the questions. Please know that you make a difference and it is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. And um, that was the case of the 47 year old. Rodrigo has meant so much to us and we're just part of this larger effort that everybody is coming together to tackle these. I think if we need at all inspiration, I was able to talk to Rodrigo just three weeks before he passed. And I called him because we had talked about starting the service and starting importantly, the translational work of getting samples. And he said, I would give samples. And he said, what you're doing is gonna benefit so many, I'll be happy and honored to help in any way possible to make this journey easier for others. That will make mine even more worthy. And then Regina, as you got to meet her already, but she said, I feel like the exact same way. If our journey helps someone else be less painful, then it'll be even more worthy. If awareness was created, then what we endured has more meaning. This is how science advances. This is how we learn. This is how medicine writes the new chapters. I hope God gives me enough years to witness the progresses that I'm sure the team will achieve. He will remain alive in the progress and one day my kids will have one more reason to be even more proud of their daddy.